Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us on Facebook and on YouTube. Coming up today, imagine waking up one morning, opening your eyes, but the world stays dark. That happened to Eric Adams, and doctors told him that his blindness was due to diabetes and that he would basically have to live the rest of his life like that. But Eric couldn't accept that. He found a healthier way, a way to reverse diabetes, the very diabetes ravaging his vision. And today we will hear how Eric Adams became healthy at last. And in India, cases of COVID-19 are exploding. With the astronomical number of infections, we are so excited to unveil a new course aimed at combating COVID-19 with food, specifically for those living in what has become the global epicenter for the coronavirus. Joining us to talk about harnessing the power of food is Dr. Zishan Ali and Munira Ali. Thank you guys so very much for joining us today. Important work we are going to be discussing. And if you have a question for Dr. Ali, go ahead and post that in the comments section now. We will be prescribing answers when we open up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. But first, let's get you caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Thursday, September 24th, 2020. The U.S. expected to reach another milestone with the coronavirus now in just a matter of days. 7 million confirmed cases. That comes as more than 41,000 new infections were reported Wednesday. The total caseload currently standing at 6.94 million. Also Wednesday, more than 1,000 deaths being reported as the death toll nears 202,000. India, meanwhile, rapidly catching up to the U.S. with 5.7 million confirmed cases, second most in the world. In nutrition news, fewer people are guzzling soda by the gallon. The percentage of adults drinking three and a half cans of soda or more per day dropped from 13 to 9 percent between 2003 and 2016. Researchers say the three and a half cans are roughly 500 calories from sugar sweetened beverages. But it appears that children are truly the ones who are souring on sugar-sweetened beverages, with just 3% now falling in the heavy consumer category. The study also finds overall that more than half the population partake in sugary beverages. Data from more than 20,000 children and 30,000 adults were used in the study published in the journey, journal, I should say, of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And speaking of healthy trends, there is a good news, bad news situation playing out over in France. Okay, schools there. About three quarters of elementary schools serve at least one meatless meal per week. That's fantastic. But under French law, all schools are required to do so. The findings come from a Greenpeace study, which has been tracking the law, which went into effect last fall. The findings also revealed that about half of all high schools and 60 percent of colleges are in compliance and offering vegan options for students. Let's move on now and talk about someone whose own health is trending in the right direction. Big time. Eric Adams. He is the president of the borough of Brooklyn in New York City. And a few years ago, Eric woke up one morning, and for all intents and purposes, he was blind. He could barely see, so he rushes to the doctor where he is diagnosed with diabetes. And the doctor tells him, look, Eric, this is something that you just have to accept. This is the way that life's going to be. We can give you medication that can help somewhat, but you will have this for the rest of your life. But here's the thing about Eric. Right? Even though diabetes runs like wildfire through his family, and even though doctors told him this was the way that it was going to be, Eric couldn't accept that because Eric is a former New York City police officer. So he did what he did his entire career, and that was open an investigation into his health. And this time, he began looking at all the facts surrounding his health, and eventually he cracks the case and stumbles upon a plant-based diet. And his health fortunes, boy, did they change dramatically and very quickly at that. And he has chronicled that journey in his new book called Healthy at Last. And I wanted to play an excerpt from my conversation with Eric that aired on the Exam Room podcast that was released this very morning. So we're going to pick up on that fateful morning where Eric's vision had vanished in the blink of an eye. I think that the best way to get that information out there is to connect with, in this case, the reader 
and that is through your story. And it's such a powerful story. And you really, you dive right into it at the top of the book, talking about waking up one morning and being blind, unable to see. That just really hooks people in. Can you talk to us a little bit about the feelings that you felt that day? You, you captured it eloquently in the book, but I'm not sure that even a million words can quite describe exactly what that situation was like for you. And that's fascinating because it happens in a re very rapid fashion. Imagine going from a normal day where, you know, I felt as though that, okay, you, I am losing, you know, vision as you get older, you, you know, you go to the reading glasses and then you go to uh, a heavy prescription. And I just really thought that this, just, this was a natural transition. And uh, one morning when I woke up, as I outlined in the book, I woke up and all of a sudden I couldn't see the alarm clock and I cleared my, tried to clear my eyes like we normally do in the morning. I thought it was sleep still in my eyes and I was unable to see and, I, and, it, and it hit me that, uh, Eric, you can't see. <laughs> and I, I thought that, is this something temporary? Did, is this something that happened? Uh, and I just eventually, uh, you know, went to the doctors and it was at the same time that I was experiencing discomfort in my stomach. I, I later, later learned out to be an ulcer and that I was um, diabetic. And it was really that ulcer, which took me to the doctor, probably saved my life, saved my limbs, saved my vision. Man, well, you sound cool, calm and collected about that now, but man, let me tell you, if that was me, I would be panicking big time. Um, but here's the thing, you get diagnosed with diabetes at that trip to the hospital. And as you mentioned in your book, diabetes runs rampant in your family. I mean, it's as common as air almost. And you were 56 at the time that you were diagnosed, correct? Yes, yes, 56. And I often, you know, when I talk about uh, the talking about it being in my family, thinking that it was hereditary. I re reference in the book uh, the day when my mother was in Florida with her other siblings and other sisters. And one of, they were actually there for a funeral and she forgot her diabetes medicine, but they said, hey, no problem. Uh, you know, I have metformin, I have this. They all have similar medicine. Little did they know that they were all using the same medicine. As I say, it wasn't so much of their DNA, it was their dinner. You know, what they were eating was in common. And so the breakdown of the body was going to be in common at the same time. Well, here's, here's why I brought up the 56 point in that, because you also had an aunt who died from diabetes, complications of diabetes at 57. Yes. So here you are getting that diagnosis at 56. You know that you had an aunt who died at 57 from the very thing that you were just diagnosed with. That had to have entered your mind. It, it did. And I thought about it uh, when the doctor told me. I recall saying to myself that, well, you knew this was coming. It is as though uh, we have this sort of sense of inevitability of just based on who we are and where we were born. And just for that moment, I said that. And then I took that moment and said, wait a minute, no, this is not going to be uh, my story. I'm not going to have the same ending in this chapter as my aunt did. And that's why I decided to do something different. And I remember saying to myself that while I'm not a doctor, but you know what? I'm an ex-cop, so I know how to do investigations. And darn it, I know how to read. <laughs> and so the goal was to let's start investigating and just finding out, you know, what is this? And it's, it's amazing how we get uh, prognosis and diagnosis, and we just take it from the person who's given it to us without saying, let me go find out what this means and what is the latest out there uh, to deal with uh, any type of medical diagnosis we receive. So what was your hypothesis then as you began to do your investigation? Did you suspect that food played a role in here or were you still leading toward hereditary? That, that is, that is a, an amazing question. This is the first time anyone ever asked me. And that's a great question because all I remember 
uh, as I lined out in the book, was taking a all the medicine. I went to the doctor's office, no medicine at the time. When I walked in, when I walked out, I had medicine for my vision loss, medicine for the neuropathic nerve damage to my right uh, thigh. I couldn't even feel my right thigh. My fingers and my toes were tingling all the time. Uh, the, the ulcer, the high blood pressure, high cholesterol. When I walked out of that doctor's office, I felt as though I was a miniature drugstore. I felt like I was Walgreens or Dwayne Reed or something from all the medicine. And there were a bunch of pamphlets and all the pamphlets said, living with diabetes. And I remember placing everything on the side of my computer, my laptop, with all of the medicine in the pamphlets. And for some reason, I changed one word from that pamphlet. Instead of living with diabetes, I typed reversing diabetes. I had no idea what was going to come up. I had no idea that food had a role. I had no idea. I don't know what I was uh, searching for. I was just basically taking a shot in the dark and just saying, listen, if there's something out there, done it, I'm going to try to find it because now I'm fighting for my sight. I'm fighting for my limbs. I'm fighting for my life. And I was not going to let anything go unturned before I find an answer. And so I had no idea that food was a pathway for me. Well, here's the interesting thing about that is that, yes, okay, there is this huge connection with food, and that seems to be driving not just diabetes, but as you also get into the book, so many other diet-related chronic diseases. But you also write in the book that you used food as a coping mechanism, especially when you were a police officer. After seeing tragic events, you write about going and, and eating at a diner at 4 a.m. Uh, after 9-11 and not even giving a second thought to what it was that you are actually eating. But when we build these relationships with food, those can be the most difficult relationships to break up from. So when you're hearing that food is driving this, were you concerned like, man, I'm going to have to figure out another way to deal with all of this drama in my life? So true. So true. Powerful question. Uh, I, th I believe that we often look at our physical presence, but I'm a firm believer that our spirit has an anatomy also. And the things we do, we try to feed both of them, our physical and our spiritual. And I knew once I started thinking it through that not only was food feeding my vital organs and not feeding them with the right things, uh, and I was becoming obese, my spirit was obese also. I was using food to really address some of the underlying reasons uh, that I was going through PTSD and trauma, uh, reliving the episodes that I was experience, uh, experiencing as a police officer and everyone else is experiencing. If you're a nurse, you're experiencing trauma all the time. If you are a child protective custody employee, you're experiencing trauma, firefighter, EMT. Uh, you, when you think about it, uh, those of us who are, are city employee, employees, public servants, uh, people don't call us to invite us to the birthday party. They call us when the party has been disrupted, something bad has happened. And we internalize that and think we can just hamburger it away, Philly steak it away, donut it away. But no, it's not going away. It's still part of us. And when I started to eat right, I knew I had to also start taking control of the reasons I was eating poorly in some cases because I was really uh, trying to self-medicate myself with food and I connected, you know, bad day, pint of haagen -Dazs. Bad day, go get the dollar menu from McDonald's. Bad day, go get a nice uh, cupcake or a big donut, uh, fried sugar, latent processed food was really feeding those bad days and I equated them this is how you got over those bad days. I want to talk a little bit about uh, your friend Cliff, who you write about in the book, a heart attack survivor. I was having a conversation recently with Dr. Kim Williams, a steam cardiologist out of Chicago. And he was telling me a story just a couple of weeks ago about how Serena Williams, uh, when she was having some medical issues, uh, was initially dismissed, basically, by her doctors, said, don't worry about it. 
And he's telling me that this happens time and time and time again in the black community. And then you write about Cliff in your book. And Cliff is actually telling the doctor about the conversation that he had with you. And Cliff is talking about eating a whole food plant-based diet. And the doctor says to him, it's too hard. But it turns out that the doctor himself is eating a whole food plant-based diet. And so I'm wondering now, is that kind of what was happening there with Cliff? <laughs> so, so true. And Cliff is a good friend. I've known him for uh, close to uh, 35, uh, 40 years. Uh, was an amazing detective, uh, served uh, for a substantial amount of time in the New York City Police Department and the Transit Police Department. And when he, he, when he had his heart attack, uh, the doctor stated that it was a good thing he came into the hospital. A friend drove him there. He stated that if he would have gone to sleep, he would not have uh, he would not have w uh, awakening after going to sleep. And it was so important that he received the medical care. But I remember him when, when he shared it with me. I told him, a Cliff, you're going to have to make a, a, a decision. You're a good detective. You're not going to do investigations. I'm going to give you a series of books so that you can read and you make your final determination. But that information should not have come from me. It should have come from his doctor. But you see, as I talk about in the book, and many people are surprised to know how our, the predispositions that we have, our beliefs uh, that we have, and some of our biases are really subliminal in nature. And so we show the stats that how some medical professionals in medical school thought black skin was thicker, thought blacks had a higher tolerance of pain, and just thought differently about their black patients. And that's what happened with Cliff. His doctor, his cardiologist felt as though uh, he couldn't follow a plant-based diet. Instead of at least giving people the option, that's all we must do in our medical institution. Give people the option. We give them the option that you could have a stent, you could have open heart surgery, you can uh, do so many other things, the type of medicine. How about giving them a lifestyle medicine option and, and help them with real behavior scientists and support and dietitians so that they can sustain a good, healthy life. Man, I could continue on with this conversation for <laughs> days. Believe you me, uh, I get fired up, man. Um, but I, I want to, I know that we only have a couple minutes left, but I, I cannot end this interview without talking about what it was you were able to accomplish with your mom and helping her transition over to the plant-based diet and improving her health. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So important. And I didn't, I didn't go to mom and say, listen, mom, you need to, you need to eat differently. Uh, this is something you need to do. I didn't. I lived my life by example. And I showed her uh, what I was doing and, and I allowed her to see. And she came to me and said, uh, son, I want to try. And I told the mom, I love you. And I want you to, to have a healthy uh, life. Uh, and it's not about living forever. It's about the quality of life while we are alive. And mom said she'll try. She was diabetic for 15 years. She was on insulin for seven years. After two months of going on a whole food plant-based diet, mom cycled off her insulin. She called me and stated, son, uh, they're taking me off my insulin. Uh, she was over 80 years old at the time. And that really uh, meant so much to me because I want all the moms to know and the dads and the cousins and the nie nieces and, and aunties all to know that how many times have we prematurely uh, went to uh, the hospital or prematurely lost a loved one? How many times we got that call that a loved one had a heart attack? Uh, it's just really empowering to know that you can wrap up a book like this, Healthy at Last, give it out for a holiday, give it to someone you love, let them, they may not read it when they get it. They may read it after coming home from a terrible diagnose, diagnosis from the doctor. They may say, let me reach for this book. They may read it when they are told that they may have to go on dialysis one day. So we don't know when a person will have that entry point, but at least they will have the information readily available. So if they say, I wanna try something different, I wanna go on a new path, I wanna do like Eric and not type living with, but reversal, at least they will have this starting place to do so.
Oh yeah, man. That is so well put. And last question. I, I also cannot let you off the hook here. You have so many great recipes in that book. So when somebody picks it up and it, it gets delivered from Amazon or wherever it is that they're getting the book from October 13th, what is the first recipe they should turn to? One of my great is pasta with kale and uh, vegan sausage or the uh, polenta stacks with black bean and corn salsa. I love it. There's a bunch of recipes here. Uh, if you like a black bean pumpkin, uh, you know, with sweet pepper salsa and, and lime mix. I mean, there's some good, good recipes. And you can even look at the, the, the meal I have on the cover. <laughs> it's a great tasting meal that I enjoy and really call people to come out. Easy read. It's not even considered a book. It's a conversation where I feel as though I'm in your living room. Uh, I'm in your den. I'm sitting down on your porch with you. And I'm just taking you into my life and saying that no matter what people say to you, and something is impossible, trust me when I tell you, you can be healthy at last. The body you have inside you that you know exists and you always want to see, it is there for you to take it. One step at a time, one page at a time, let's be healthy at last. Now you be talking them recipes, got my mouth worn out, I gotta dive this <laughs> side of my mouth, man. Dag, go on, that sounds good. Uh, Eric Adams, Healthy at Last is the book we are going to put a link to. Go ahead and pre-order it right now in the episode notes. So just scroll on down. It's also in the show description if you're watching this on Facebook or on YouTube. Eric Adams, president of the Borough of Brooklyn. Thank you so very much for your time, sir. Thank you. Appreciate you. Great seeing you again. Ooh, man, I'm telling you, I got a chance to try those. Ooh, they are tasty indeed. So go check that out. But seriously, recapping that, can you imagine being, you know, in your doctor's office, the doctor essentially has the cure for what ails you, but then saying, you know what, I'm not going to prescribe that to you because it's too difficult. Isn't that, isn't that wild? Anyway, uh, great book. Uh, I have tweeted out a link to pick that up uh, at Chuck Carroll WLC if you want to pick up a copy of Healthy at Last. And you can also, that was only half of the interview. We get into so much more. If you go and head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you get your favorite podcast from, look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Check out the episode that dropped this very morning with Eric Adams called Healthy at Last. Go ahead and subscribe now. And if you would be so kind as to also leave a five-star rating and share it with your friend, we would be ever so grateful. All right, moving on now. We are very excited here at the Physicians Committee about a new program that we are rolling out designed to help people who live in India and are fighting COVID-19 with food. The timing of this program is absolutely critical as the cases there continue to explode. Really, India now the global epicenter for the coronavirus. Rates of infections there exceeding anything that we have seen here in the U.S. So we're going to do our part to help with using the power of food to combat COVID-19. That is the series. You see the webpage right there on your screen. It is being conducted completely in Hindi. And the man who is spearheading this effort is Dr. Zishan Ali. I am thrilled that he is joining us here today on the exam room live. Dr. Ali, thank you so very much for being here. I think you might be muted there, Dr. Ali. Yeah, there we go. Hey, now now you got it. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Ali. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone, whoever is hearing from in USA and abroad. Uh, thank you so much for being there. And we are so excited to tell you about this program. We will do it in Hindi language for the first time ever, Chuck. We have never oh. done this program in Hindi before. I know when you when you sent me an email telling me, hey, check this out. This is what we're going to do. I was like, oh, my gosh, what a fantastic idea, especially again, you look at the, the caseload. I mean, yesterday, India reported 86,000 new cases here in the U.S. It was only 41,000, currently averaging 87,000 new cases uh, of COVID-19 a day in India. So when you're talking about combating COVID-19 with food, the timing on this, Dr. Ali, could not be any better. So can't, can't agree enough with you, Chuck. This is so true that I was just reading on only yesterday the 98,000 cases in a day and India and how it has it is rising exponentially in the last few months. I'm really, really alarmed by how things are going. But what you said correctly is that let's do our part. 
let's try to make a uh, whatever we can to make people in india healthy with the food so that's why we came up with this program and we have done several programs in english language and we thought let's reach to people who are unable to hear us because of a language barrier and because uh, i'm fluent uh, in hindi and my wife munir ali is here she speaks hindi and we have dr vanita rahman she speaks good hindi we thought let's do a program in hindi language so chuck do you mind i share a small powerpoint presentation with the audience oh by all means please the stage is yours my friend thank you and i am about to share the powerpoint and here you go everybody able to see yeah we got that my yes. friend okay so we have this program is called aaye milkar sehat banaye corona ko kare dur apni sehat rakhe bharpoor that means let's build our health together keep corona away uh, with a good food with a good health please uh, those who are who are in india speak hindi they can register for this program at pcrm.org forward slash healthy india sorry there is a typo it's health india written there but actually it's healthy india uh, moving to the next slide uh, we have is there will be three zoom webinars starting on october 7 october 14 and october 28 it's a free program and the objectives of these webinars is that participants will be able to describe the role of nutrition in chronic illnesses and chuck you know that india is a diabetes capital of the world with 79 pe pe million people uh, with diabetes and there are millions more whose diabetes have not been diagnosed and we have other conditions like heart disease and hypertension and obesity so we want to tell people that look these conditions are reversible they can be prevented and even reversed by just changing the food we eat that's correct then the participants will be able to identify how healthful indian foods have changed with westernization we were eating very good food in the last i would say 20 30 years back full of lentils and vegetables and fruits and grains but because of the westernization our food habits have changed and this is the reason why our uh, diabetes uh, numbers have significantly increased over the last 20 to 30 years then this uh, another objective is that participants will be able to learn how to prepare healthful meals using traditional health healthy diets with foods and that's where my wife munir ali will come into picture and she will tell people that how they can make their meals healthy without using dairy without using meat without using oils and these are some health experts who are participating in the show number one you can see the picture of our own dr vanita rahman she is a doctor at bernard medical center then it's my picture without a beard of course it's a <laughs> old picture and then my wife munira ali and then shubhangi sinha she is also works at bernard medical center and chat we also would like to have some guest speakers and we are having some guest speakers and there are many more who will join the list but as of now you can see the picture of on the left uh, nidhi nahata she's the founder of just be cafe in bangalore it's 100% vegan restaurant and she's an amazing person we collaborated uh, uh, an event uh, in 2019 with her and that was great and then on the right you see dr pramod tripathi he's the founder of freedom from diabetes another amazing person and he has really done a great amount of work in india reversing diabetes of millions of people and we will have people from dr nandita shah's team and only today i was in touch with her and we will soon have a confirmation from her team as well uh program details on october 7 our focus will be on diabetes how we can reverse diabetes with food what is the science behind the power of food to reverse diabetes so we will cover all that then we will take question and answers everything in hindi and then munira will tell will demonstrate some recipes which are very useful for people with diabetes and how they can make their food so that they can tackle their insulin resistance and they can cut down the fats in their diet especially animal fats and how they can prevent and reverse diabetes second program will be on october 14 and the focus of that program will be on heart disease and heart health 
and we will talk everything about the science behind the power of food to reverse heart diseases. And the last uh, series will focus on obesity and how to tackle that with food. Um, uh, here, I, I already told you that we will have cooking demonstrations with Munira Ali, and Munira is here with me, and she can tell you a little bit more about what she will do actually in the cooking demonstration, Munira? You want to share with people? Sure. Hello, everyone. This is Munira Ali, and I am a certified food for life instructor. So I've been trained perfectly for the how to teach people how to make their food healthier and more nutritious. Back in India, firstly, I, I would just like to collaborate that uh, the same thing what my husband said and Chuck said that's, that there cannot be a better timing right now as if as right now India is having terrible, terrible death rate and infection rate. And we all know COVID is having this problem because of the immunity and the uh, different uh, problems which is already underlying. And diabetes, heart rate, and there are different things going on. So uh, what I will do, Munira, is let me finish with this presentation, uh -huh. and then you can talk about what you, sure. because in that way people can see your face and yeah. expressions, and I think that will be really important. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much. So then Munira will do the cooking demonstration, and we will come back to that part. And the, the, the take home message for this program is that our Indian cuisine is helpful and highly embraced by people around the world. So we want to bring the power of Indian food back to the uh, back in the country and show people that how bringing traditional Indian food and avoiding the westernization of the food can reverse so many different chronic conditions. Uh, we will also talk about what the real assets of Indian cuisine, including regular use of turmeric and garlic and onion and fennel seeds and whatnot, mustard seeds and fenugreek seeds we use every day in our meal. And let's bring those again in the center of our plate. And then lastly, that people would learn how to avoid dairy and meat products and how to substitute them with helpful ingredients. So I would say I would uh, like to stop there uh, and please register at pcrm.org forward slash healthy India. My contact information is here, zali at pcrm.org. Again, that's Z-A-L-I at pcrm.org. Thank you so much. And I will be, be yeah. stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Munira, let's let's talk about the best part, you know, and, and that is the food there. As a food for life instructor, I know that you know how to whip up all kinds of delicious dishes. So what are some of the foods that you'll be preparing during these uh, during this course? Yeah, sure. Because India is all we are very social people and India is my home country. So I would like to tell people that we are not we are not going to starve you. We are not going to co uh, compromise on the taste of Indian food, Indian aroma. Everything will be right there, but we will make it more nutritious, more healthier. So, Chuck, we are traditionally eating very well, very healthy food with legumes, a lot of vegetables, lentils, whatnot. And our spices, they are right now as turmeric is such a big thing in US that people are having the chai, tea, latte, they are gonna have everything with the turmeric in the very good packaging and all, but we are using it from ages. It is like a staple in every curry, in every food we make. I have seen as far my mother's kitchen and my in Lost Kitchen, everywhere it is a staple. So this is just one of the wonder spice that I'm talking about, but there are so many different spices that I use in my day-to-day -day life and the day-to-day -day cuisine. But the problem, the problem, oh yeah, we can see my masala dabba, which yeah. is just few of the many spices that I use many uh, every day. So, what I want to share with my fellow Indians and the problem which I also, uh, it is very challenging for me when I try to cut off the fats and oil from my food. That is the problem. That is the problem which is creating yeah. such a havoc with the health of Indians. We are having, for example, we are having dal. It is 
full of so many nutrition and nutritious values and all the great things in it. But what we do, we do the tempering with ghee, butter, and like there is a big thick layer on the, every food of oil that reduce its nutritional value. So I want to teach them how to you can make the tempering, which we call tarka, in a, without oil. Without how ghee. I can, yeah, without ghee, without butter. So they can have their healthier meal and yet they can, it tastes the same way. It is just the, the problem here, the mindset that it cannot be the same way because I have changed my dietary, the way I cook things. So I want to share them all those tips and all those techniques. So it will be, I will be really delighted to even teach them how to make chai with almond milk, yes. not the regular milk. Not dairy. And yeah. also the paneer, which is becoming the next big, like in, here over here, the cheese is the thing. In yeah. India, it's paneer. Everything, even though if they are vegetarian, they will eat paneer in every sort of thing. So I try to, Tell them how they can replace it, how they can swap it with tofu, a right. more healthier option. So this is one of the parts. And I will also teach them how to make their own soy yogurt at home. Wow. So this, there are so many excited things that I would like to share with them. I want to teach them carrot halwa because India is full of festivals. And festival means sweets yeah. and lots of sweets. And definitely with a lot of ghee, sugar, and all sorts of bad things. So I can teach them a healthier version. Outstanding. I mean, so many different options are going to be on the table. I mean, you, again, just like Eric Adams had my mouth watering earlier. Yeah. Now you've got my mouth watering too. So you know what? I mean, just uh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> I, I cannot wait. This is so exciting. So you see the uh, address to register there, pcrm.org slash healthy India, a completely free course. That is the coolest thing ever. Three dates starting October 7th, then you have one on the 14th, and then again on the 28th. Absolutely free to register. Go ahead and do that now, pcrm.org slash Healthy India. Dr. Ali, stick around really quick because we do still have to open up the doctor's mailbag. And we're going to be uh, actually following up on exactly what it was that you were just talking about. Today's question comes to us from Perry. He's looking to improve his culinary skills and boost his health at the same time. He wants to know... What are the healthiest traditional Indian spices? Can you offer him any help? Yes, definitely. I can name a few. And I know Munira would like to add to it because he's the one who actually uses them. I'm the one who actually reads about them. So I would say um, we definitely, I would recommend use, using turmeric. I would say using coriander powder. Then we have fennel seeds, cumin seeds. These are all amazing uh, spices we, we use every day. And you will be surprised a little bit of, I would say, maybe a few few uh, chunk, a little bit, uh, one teaspoon, I would say. One teaspoon would be great to use fenugreek seeds. And this is Very something good. which is, it's actually, it's bitter in taste, but it has so many good properties, even for people who have diabetes. And there, there are anecdotal and scientific evidence about fenugreek seeds being very useful. Uh, I would say another cardamom and uh, black pepper and cloves. These are commonly used in our cuisine. And again, they have, for example, cloves have a good properties where people use it for have when they have toothache. So they use it a lot. And cardamom is my favorite whenever I use it as my chewing gum. So in my office meetings, when I'm having cardamom, my office team is always asking about, hey, what is that? This is this smells so good. So I would recommend, strongly recommend using cardamom for that. All right. Sounds great. Dr. Ali Munira, thank you guys so very much for your time today. I appreciate yeah. that. Can't wait to hear uh, about your course, how that goes. Again, pcrm.org slash Healthy India. Thank you guys both. Thank you so thank much. You so much Jack. Jack. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.
Coming up tomorrow on the show, Dr. Neil Barnard will be back. He's going to be joined by Dr. Jim Loomis. And you know what that means? A big old Q&A to end the week, the doctor's mailbag. So let's go ahead and flood it right now with questions. You can get yours in early by posting it in the comments section or tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room live. But for today, that is all the time that we have. I want to thank the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. And you, my friend, for watching my exam room. We appreciate you tuning in. For Dr. Zishan Ali, Munira Ali, and everyone here at the Physicians Committee. I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so very much for watching. And until tomorrow, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it.